Welcome. My name is Dean Reuter. I'm the Vice President and Director of the Federal Society's Practice Groups. I thank you all for being here today. This is the third and final day of the National Lawyers Convention. If it's the only day you've been able to attend, I'll tell you this is going to be the best day of the convention. So uh, thanks for being here. And we might even have a surprise or two uh, at the end of the day. So I hope everybody's able to stick around for the entire day. Don't tell anybody outside this room I mentioned a surprise. But, um, but first, our uh, third showcase panel uh, is ready to begin. Uh, Judge Edith Jones, our moderator for today, is the chief of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, having been appointed by President Ronald Reagan in 1985. Uh, and more importantly, I think for our purposes today, uh, she's a good friend of the Federalist Society and a frequent uh, appearer here at the National Lawyers Convention. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through her uh, long resume uh, and, and all her distinctions. I'll just turn things over to her. So please help me welcome uh, Judge Jones. Uh, thank you so much for coming this morning and particularly for showing up at 9 a.m. I think we're going to have a very spirited and fascinating discussion on the subject of term limits and entitlement reform and random assignment of members of Congress to committees. But that's really just a, uh, a global uh, description of whatever the panelists who are very talented choose to say about the, uh, the circus that is our Congress today. Uh, we decided to forego extensive uh, introductions and resumes of our speakers, most of whom are known to you personally or by reputation. But we'll start off with Professor uh, Stephen Calabresi from Northwestern. We'll move to uh, Professor Eskridge from Yale, then to Professor Enzalibi from uh, Northwestern, and finally to Bill Crystal to sum up. And I, I would ask them all to comment at some brief point on the old Lamar Alexander phrase, which was one solution to Congress is to cut their pay and send them home. But I'd add a little to that. I'd say cut their staff, cut their pay, and send them home. But with that, we'll hear from Professor Calabresi. Thank you very much, Judge Jones. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning. and. I want to talk about term limits for service on congressional committees and other questions related to selection of uh, congressional committees. A recurring theme throughout American history has been debate about the wisdom or folly of imposing term limits on government officials. I want to begin by describing four experiments in U.S. history with term limits. And then I want to propose a system of term limits for membership on congressional committees. I will defend in my talk today the idea that no one should be allowed to serve for longer than about 10 years on any congressional committee. In my view, members of Congress who serve for longer than that are liable to be captured by special interest groups they're supposed to be regulating. So the first use of term limits in American history dates back to the founding of the Republic in the 1770s. Thus, the U.S. government, under the Articles of Confederation, imposed term limits for service in the Continental Congress. In part, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the framers of the Articles of Confederation thought that the British Parliament, which was 3,000 miles away from the 13 colonies, had lost uh, touch with the colonists' policy views, and they thus opted for term limits in the Continental Congress, whose members served hundreds of, way, of miles away from their home states to keep them from developing what we now call an inside the beltway perspective. The framers of the U.S. Constitution rejected the idea of term limits for members of Congress. They thought term limits were undemocratic because they prevented voters from sending people with experience and expertise in government to Congress. The framers of, uh, imposed three and only three qualifications on members of Congress, a minimum age requirement, a minimum number of years a, a prospective member had to have been a U.S. citizen, and a requirement that members of Congress live in the state or district that they represent. 
In the 1980s and 1990s, a large number of states, 22 states out of 50, tried by initiative to add a fourth requirement by term limiting members of the House of Representatives to six years and members of the Senate to 12 years. These proposals basically worked by saying that no one would be eligible to be on the ballot if they were running for a term having served already six years in the House or 12 years in the Senate. The Supreme Court struck down state-imposed term limits on members of Congress by a five to four vote in a major case, U.S. term limits against Thornton. And the court said the only way to impose term limits on members of Congress is by a constitutional amendment. Suffice it to say, it is sufficiently impossible to pass constitutional amendments. So the prospect of term limits being imposed by amendment on Congress anytime soon are absolutely nil. This killed the modern movement to term limit members of Congress. There was a second surfacing of the idea of term limits in American history during the Jacksonian era that lasted from 1829 to 1861. President Andrew Jackson himself argued strenuously for limiting the service of federal administrative officials with a policy he called rotation in office. Jackson's idea was that federal administrative officials ought not to hold executive office for long periods of time, but that each new presidential administration should bring, a, bring in a wave of new appointees to the federal bureaucracy with it. Hence the phrase rotation in office. Johnson thought rotation in office would keep the federal government closer to the people and he resented the idea of an elitist career civil service. All government jobs, even those in non-policy making units like the post office, thus turned over quite regularly during the Jacksonian period. Eventually, the public quite rightly became tired of what had come to become, what had come to be known as the Jacksonian spoil system, and in the 1880s and 1890s, rotation in office came to an end and was replaced by the creation of a career civil service. Even to this day, however, it is routine for the 3,000 or so most important jobs in the executive branch to turn over completely every time a new administration is voted into power in the White House. We thus retain a significant element of the rotation in office idea for staffing the executive branch. A third surfacing of the term limits idea in American public life occurred during the 1940s when President Franklin D. Roosevelt broke the old two-term tradition for service as president by running for and winning four consecutive terms in office. Many Americans in the 1940s strongly disapproved of FDR's breaking of the two-term two tradition that had been set by George Washington and that had been followed from 1789 to 1940. Americans were especially concerned because in the 1940s, many countries, many foreign countries had fallen under the sway of strongmen dictators like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Benito Mussolini, and Mao Zedong. While President Roosevelt did not abuse power and behave dictatorially in the way that those individuals did, President Roosevelt did do things like trying to pack the Supreme Court, which many thought violated our constitutional conventions. In, as in response, after President Roosevelt's death, the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution limiting presidents to two terms was proposed, and it was ratified in 1951. It has, in my view, reduced the threat of overbearing presidential behavior and has put presidents on a shorter leash than was the case with FDR or Harry Truman. I think given the huge growth in, fed in presidential power since the New Deal, I personally think the two-term limit on presidents is a healthy corrective. The, a fourth and final surfacing of the term limits idea in American public life has come with recent op-eds and editorials calling for an 18-year term limit on U.S. Supreme Court justices. The notion here is that U.S. Supreme Court justices historically 
over all of our history have served an average of 15 years on the court. Um, recent re justices who've retired since 1970, however, have served an average of 26 years on the court. So the existence of life tenure along with longer lifespans is leading to much longer tenure for Supreme Court justices. Governor Rick Perry has endorsed the idea of a term limit on Supreme Court justices, but it has not yet gained major traction. I personally think there's a lot to recommend it. The idea of term limits on congressional committees is, of course, not wholly new. Congress has experimented with term limits for serving as the chair of a committee, and there are a few committees, like the budget committees, where members are term limited. The basic rule, however, for service on the overwhelming majority of congressional committees is that members can serve as long as they want. I think term limits for service on congressional committees would do a lot to eliminate the bias in favor of big government that is now so prevalent on Capitol Hill. A key problem with congressional committees, as they're currently staffed, is that members of Congress seek committee assignments that are important to interest groups in their home states. Members from farming states gravitate toward the agriculture committees. Members from Wall Street and New York State gravitate toward the Finance and Ways and Means Committees. And members from hawkish states gravitate toward the Armed Services Committees. Um, co congressional committee slots are, in essence, captured from the outset to some degree by the very special interests a median member of Congress might otherwise resist. The basic dynamic of the congressional committees uh, is that they get captured by special interests and then try to alter federal policy to suit the states and house districts uh, that elect them and that have a big interest in their, uh, in their policies. This problem is especially uh, shar uh, sharply illustrated by the Senate and House Appropriations Committees the members of which work overtime to try to funnel federal tax money back to their home states or districts. The careers of former Senators Robert Byrd of West Virginia or Ted Stevens of Alaska are a case in point. Senators Byrd and Stevens should have been term limited to 10 years on the Appropriations Committee, and because they were not term limited, there was a huge amount of waste of federal tax money. It's absolutely essential that at least membership on the Appropriations Committees and on the way Finance and Ways and Means Committees be terminated. Be term limited, not terminated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, members of Congress, <laughs> mem members of Congress ought not to tax Members of Congress ought not to tax the nation to feather their own nest in one particular state or house district. This is an abuse of power which we ought to stop. When it comes to the appropriations and tax writing committees, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Term limits offer a partial solution. A related solution, which I'm very enthusiastic about to the Robert Byrd, Ted Stevens problem, is one that goes way beyond term limits. And that is, I recommend that when members of Congress, when slots open up on, on committees, I would recommend initially assigning members to those slots by the random drawing of lots. Uh, there, this is how the federal courts of appeals handle the assignment of federal cases and controversies to panels of three judges. If a, ca if a bunch of cases are filed in a federal court of appeals, the judges don't get to look over the list and say, here, here are the ones I'm really interested in and I want to sit on. The cases are randomly assigned. Similarly, there is a need for congressional committees. Congressional committees play an important role, but there's no reason in the world why farm state representatives should be able to self-select for agriculture committees or um, other instances of that kind. Um, I should note we also use random assignment not only for what cases go to panels of federal judges, we, we use random assignment in picking juries and in having jurors decide cases. 
Random assignment could then allow a member to serve a reasonable term of years, say 10 years, enough time so the member could develop expertise to do their job well, but we could disempower representatives from robbing the nation to benefit the particular state or district they represent. Um, I think it is, um, our, I think our goal as reformers should be to try to find a golden mean whereby the ability to self-select committee mem membership and to serve for 40 years is balanced by the need to protect against capture by inside the Beltway interests. An advantage of term limiting the service of members of Congress on committees and randomly assigning them to new committees is that it would eliminate the incentive for that, for example, Alaska voters had to re-elect Senator Ted Stevens or that West Virginia voters had to re-elect Senator Byrd. A lot of voters kept re-electing these two men well into their old age simply because their seniority and committee memberships made re-electing re them a good deal financially for the residents of their home states. We ought not to have an incentive structure in place that financially rewards states that keep re-electing superannuated politicians. If a state like Massachusetts wants to re-elect a senator like Ted Kennedy for almost 50 years because they like him, that should be fine. But we ought not to have a financial incentive structure in place that rewards voters for keeping incumbents in office indefinitely who they might like less well. Um, so with those, I'll conclude with those thoughts, and I'm sure there will be uh, much discussion and disagreement. I should say in conclusion, I recognize that calling for random assignment of members of Congress to committees and term limits for service on committees is not an idea that's going to be greeted with much enthusiasm on Capitol Hill, but then, but then direct election of senators wasn't initially greeted with much enthusiasm on Capitol Hill, and we all know that the 17th Amendment was ultimately passed by the Senate, so major changes can happen. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about uh, Professor Calabresi's proposal, and I want to start with um, one of the things I like about it. I'm one of those voters from West Virginia who kept re-electing Senator Byrd to the Senate. <laughs> uh, I was born in West Virginia, I voted there for many decades, uh, and I actually received the Robert Byrd Award for being valedictorian for my high school class, and got a check for $25. And so that ensured that I was going to vote for him uh, for the rest of the time I was in West Virginia. But uh, Calabresi is absolutely correct. Um, on many fronts. And the criticism, I think, I would make a broader criticism, if I could, Steve, and that is that it's not just uh, Byrd and Stevens individually, but it was Byrd and Stevens as the rent-seeking duo, because they had this back-scratching arrangement where it didn't matter who was chair of the committee. Sometimes it was Stevens, sometimes it was Byrd. Uh, they scratched each other's backs and funded each other's programs very liberally. Uh, and uh, as a West Virginian, I will say uh, the real victims of this were not just the public fisc, but actually was West Virginia itself. Uh, there's a Robert Byrd Highway. There were about 20 Robert Byrd Highways. Uh, there were Robert Byrd agencies. I can remember two, and a third one eludes me. Uh, there were Robert Byrd restrooms uh, all through the state. And it, the, it was a massive infusion of wasteful federal money into West Virginia that has done nothing to solve West Virginia's underlying problems, which are themselves massive. So I'll start with, uh, with a, a, a big endorsement of a lot of the impulses that underlie Professor Calabresi's proposal. Now comes some skepticism. Uh, we don't have a lot of data and experience with the particular proposal uh, that Steve has introduced for our consideration. Because as he pointed out, most of the term limit proposals and laws that have been enacted are more global. President cannot serve more than two terms, not what committees the president can serve on. Fifteen states, at least, uh, currently have term limit laws in effect. I'm not aware that any of those term limit laws uh, goes to committee service. But they do limit uh, to roughly 
six, eight, ten years, the amount of time that individuals can serve uh, in either branch of the legislature. Some of them are lifetime uh, limits and some of them are not. Uh, and these have actually been much studied. Uh, there are some uh, University of California political science studies of the California term limits, which were adopted in 1990. Uh, and then the joint project on term limits, which includes a number of very serious organizations and a lot of scholars, has studied term limits in most of the 15 states that have adopted them. Okay? And here are the conclusions that these studies reach, again, uh, admitting that this is not exactly the same proposal as the one that Professor Calabresi has suggested. But it does, uh, in effect, create term limits on committees, since members of the California uh, Assembly can't serve for more than, what, six years. So that obviously limits the amount of time they're going to be on committees. Uh, and the conclusions are as follows from, from all of these studies. The first conclusion, um, which should give us some concern, and particularly Judge Jones, and I'm going to answer your question, Judge Jones, uh, is um, that it creates a power vacuum in the legislature. Uh, that term limits, to a certain extent, have disabled legislatures at the state level uh, from doing the job that, that we think they should be doing and that state constitutions instruct them to do. So specifically, for example, um, leaders in the legislature, committee chairs, uh, majority leaders, whatnot, are almost automatically lame ducks by the time they assume leadership positions, uh, which undermines their ability to uh, craft uh, legislative responses to, say, gubernatorial initiatives, to major public problems, uh, to de regulatory proposals, for example, which also proliferate at the state level uh, and are almost impossible to get through the legislature for a variety of reasons. And the studies indicate this might be one of them. Uh, it deprives committee members of uh, expertise. Uh, and you can joke about that and say, well, even the experts uh, have created a, glo a global and colossal mess for us. And, and there's a certain extent that's true. Uh, but frankly, uh, you do need a certain amount of expertise for members of the committees and legislators to do their jobs. And think about this as well. Uh, if the legislators themselves don't deeply understand the budgetary process, the tax process, let's talk about the Judiciary Committee, the legal process, uh, then uh, power is not going to dissipate. It's going to go somewhere else. And can you think, Judge Jones, where it might go? The courts. It's going to go to the staff. That's what all these studies have found. <laughs> that power gravitates, number one, to the staff. So Judge Jones, you said we should uh, cut their pay, cut their staff, and send them home. Well, if we do term limits, you might cut their pay, and they might just go home because they're bored. But the staff is then going to be running things. And in a democracy, this ought to give us pause. Moreover, what they found in most of these states is that power shifts to the governor. And I leave it to you to evaluate whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, whether governors, say Governor Brown in California, uh, should have more power at the expense of the legislature. But that's been one effect of term limits. Have these effects been dramatic? No. These have not been dramatic effects. Uh, we're still in the early stages. Well, what about the possibility that term limits will limit the ability of lobbyists and um, corporate uh, money uh, to capture uh, legislatures? Uh, do term limits solve this? Well, the state studies indicate term limits do not solve it for the good old reason of the hydraulic problem. Uh, and that is that lobbyists, like locusts, will accumulate and exercise their influence uh, whatever the rules of the legislative process are. And this has been what we found at the state level from California on down. Uh, there's no indication, according to the studies, of diminished fundraising from interest groups or diminished lobbying influence. Um, the uh, <coughs> lobbyists and the money raisers uh, proliferate. The amount of money going into the state legislative process is still massive and it's been increasing, though probably no more than it would have without the reform. Uh, it just simply has not dented it. Now, the joint project on term limits actually did find this effect. And they found that there was a redistributive effect, which might be rather interesting. And that is that term limits did redistribute access to legislators away from the veteran lobbyists and toward the newer, younger lobbyists. 
Now, they didn't find a particularly systematic uh, effect on government policy. There might be one. They just didn't look for that. Uh, but it did find a redistribution, uh, creating a more level playing field for lobbyists generally. So if you believe in an equal access clause for lobbyists, this is probably a good idea. Um, uh, Senator Byrd, for example, uh, you might not know, spent most of his lengthy career, uh, I believe he's the longest serving senator in American history, uh, he spent most of his career, much of his career as minority leader or majority leader, and not as chair of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, and so at what, whatever point Byrd relinquished his majority leadership, uh, specifically so he could be chair of the Appropriations Committee, uh, uh, Byrd, even if he'd had no experience whatsoever on the committee, came pre-prepared to extract huge rents. And I think Senator Stevens, who served on the Appropriations Committee much longer, had the same capability. So I think uh, one of the effects of a term limit proposal, would it prevent interest group crap capture? I'm not optimistic. It might change the conditions of the capture from gradual surrender to immediate capitulation uh, when people become members or chairs of these committees. Uh, now, Judge Jones invited me um, uh, and the rest of us, uh, if we were going to uh, criticize Professor Calabresi's really quite brilliant and wonderful proposal, to come up with our own ideas of what would we do to Congress if we wanted one reform. And here is my candidate. Uh, I don't know that it would shrink the size of government, but I think it would enable Congress uh, to better perform the democratic functions that it is supposed to be performing under the Constitution. And my reform would be either to eliminate the filibuster or following some of the Senate proposals to make the filibuster harder to mount, or at least harder to mount for an indefinite period of time. Uh, the filibuster, uh, as you know, is not part of the Constitution. Uh, many people consider it unconstitutional, in fact. Uh, it's strongly anti-majoritarian. Uh, which uh, might give some of you in the audience uh, some delight. Well, great. Uh, anything that would keep the government from doing things uh, is probably uh, a good feature of our uh, Senate uh, practice. And I think that's wrong, with all due respect. Uh, that the blocking function of the filibuster, particularly in this day and time, uh, where many of the thoughtful proposals in Congress are deregulatory, uh, the filibuster makes that virtually impossible. Consider the possible scenario, uh, say Mitt Romney or Newt Gingrich or Herman Cain is elected president next year, and the Republicans capture the Senate and hold the House, which is uh, very, very uh, possible. Well, you think with that mandate they would be able to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Well, you would be wrong. Uh, if the Democrats have a filibuster-proof uh, minority, and the Democrats stick together, always a chancy proposition, you would not be able to repeal the Affordable Care Act, even if President Romney, the author of it in many ways, uh, <laughs> was elected on a platform of repealing it, even if all of the Republican senators were elected on a platform of repealing it, even if all the Republican representatives were elected on such a platform, you still would not be able to repeal that statute. And why? Because the fil think about that. Uh, and moreover, the existence of the filibuster uh, is not libertarian the way it operates in our government. The existence of the filibuster uh, usually requires buying off the filibusterers. And I mean that literally buying off Senator Byrd, Senator Stevens, and others who would engage in that tactic. And usually the way you buy off a minority is by shoveling money and programs for the minority that they want, and then they'll go along with you. Now, even if you are willing to swallow the filibuster and keep it going, uh, I would strongly urge uh, the Federal Society uh, and other thoughtful uh, policy groups uh, to end, curtail, criticize the judicial filibuster. Now, that is an innovation. We've had the filibuster around for quite a while. Uh, the technique of filibustering judicial nominees is relatively new. Uh, and judges uh, such as Miguel Estrada uh, and many other of the brainiest appointees that recent presidents have nominated to the bench are clearly casualties of the judicial filibuster. And the judicial filibuster, as objectionable, I think, as it is, has recently gotten worse, at least in practice. Uh, at least the filibuster you can break with um, uh, 60 votes. Now, Judge Estrada was not able to get 60 votes, and a number of others are, are not either. Uh, but even if you've got your 60 votes today, 
And under President Romney or President Kane or President Gingrich, even if next year or two years from now you're able to get 60 votes, a lot of brainy nominees are still not going to be put on federal appeals courts because of senatorial holds and the blue slip practice where individual senators can indefinitely delay and typically veto uh, qualified nominees. Uh, and that is very objectionable and I consider that a threat to our liberties in the most basic sense uh, because one of the institutions I think that does work in the United States, you can criticize Congress, uh, but I do think the federal judiciary, we get great value for our dollar. And I think the smarter the people we have on the federal judiciary, I don't care about their ideology, the smarter the people we have on the federal judiciary, I think the better it will work. Uh, and we're grotesquely understaffed now. Uh, I think we'll remain understaffed as long as the Democrats have a filibuster minority under, say, President Romney et al. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, this is, I think, a minor national problem uh, that we should be addressing. So I respectfully submit these proposed reforms, and we continue to study Professor Calabresi's very thoughtful proposal. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, David and Dean and Federal Society staff for inviting me to this uh, distinguished panel, uh, Steve, Bill, Judge, and uh, Bill, I just want to thank every one of you, and I, I, when I heard the topic, uh, term limits of six years, uh, random assignments, it seemed like a really inspired uh, kind of reform proposal. And then immediately I went to the idea of how could this be implemented. And then uh, I kind of came up with a topic, it was challenges to implementation. And then that just didn't seem quite right. So I changed it to obstacles to implementation. And then that didn't seem to capture it, so I changed it to politically insurmountable obstacles to implementation. <laughs> and, and then that seemed a little bit too cynical, so I said politically insurmountable obstacles to implementation, and in case I'm wrong, things that we ought to think about. So that's the optimistic uh, swing to it. Now, I just wanted to say the addition of sort of the congressional committee system that we have has existed pretty much the standing permanent committees since the 15th Congress. This is around 1817, 1818. And it hasn't changed much. And it's not because there are not, have not been serious reform proposals. I mean, some of us maybe remember the 1995, I mean, 1994 reform uh, movement. There have been serious, and at least since the end of Second World War, there have been five serious reform proposals, right? And there was political momentum behind it, and they wanted to reform, and they pointed to some of the issues, in fact, I think exactly the critical issues. There were issues of whether or not the committees were overrepresenting special interests, and whether policy issues were fragmented among too many committees that had too many jurisdictions. In fact, one of the interesting things is one of the big reform polls that it was able to pull out is that the consolidation of the work of six standing committees, I think, in the Appropriations Committee in the 1920s was one they could pull off rather easily. But for the most part, you come with reform proposals. There's a lot of political momentum behind it. Everybody remembers the 1994 contract with America. It's like all the Republican, I think 97% of them signed on to it. They said they were going to push through. They had very, very kind of optimistic views about what would happen. And then they achieved some reform, but much, much less than we anticipated. And the question is, what are the obstacles? I want to start off with one. There's actually a constitutional obstacle that is un underappreciated here. Article 1, Section 5 gives each chamber the power to determine the rule of its own proceedings. Now, what does this mean? Now, let's take term limits as an example refer to 15 states that have term limits in their state legislatures. They started off being 22, right? State Supreme Courts, I think, struck down four. I think legislators reversed another two. But how do these term limits get implemented? It turns out, for the most part, most of them come from direct initiatives, right? Members of state legislatures do not like to impose term limits on themselves. Utah and Louisiana did their state legislators did, but it was under the threat of an initiative. They don't usually come up, and this is what, if you want to call it, motivational consistency. That is, if I'm a member of Congress, and I'm going to go to Congress, and you take away the benefits for going to Congress from me, right, I'm not going to voluntarily give it up on my own, 
if you force me to give it up, maybe I'll do it, right? But this is a key problem, is that there's very little way to directly implement this. You cannot constitutionally change the rules of Congress by voting, uh, getting a public referendum, unless you amend the Constitution. So you have to rely on members of Congress to do this. Now, what are the political obstacles of doing this? The political obstacles is that the re-election motive, right, as much as we don't want it to be the motivation for members of Congress, rings large. Political scientists who study this, when they take it and use it as a unit of analysis, it gives them a lot of predictive value. Re-election drives a lot of members of Congress. And what do we mean, right? It doesn't necessarily mean, okay, I just want to be here forever. But the idea of why we fear re-election is the idea that a member of Congress, like we've alluded to maybe uh, Stevens and, and Byrd and others, will target benefits to their constituencies, probably at the expense of the national interest, right? This is sort of the concern that we have with the idea of the re-election motive. But here's where it gets tricky. You can sit here and say, let's say Steve can turn to me and say, I'm a citizen of Illinois or Rhode Island or wherever you, know, you might be a citizen of. And you look out and you see somebody like Bird and you say, he is a problem. Right? He's destroying, he's diverting the natural resources, everything we have to West Virginia. Not a good thing. The reality is that you can feel that way, you can feel intensely about it, but you can't do anything about it unless you are a citizen of West Virginia and the people of West Virginia like Robert Byrd. Despite the kind of concerns, I think, that you express how this could be harmful, people generally, yes, if you throw a lot of money at someone, it could damage them, but people generally do not dislike you when you throw a lot of money at them. <laughs> Even if it ultimately harms you, you may get drunk, you may get lazy, you may forget how to do things, you generally tend to be happy with people who throw money at you. And what happens is that one of the things that these committees do is that they enable members of Congress to bargain in a way to deliver benefits to their constituents, bargains that would be hard to enforce and keep to if they didn't have these committees, right? So it's like you have property rights. You say, this is, I own, I'm on the Financial Services Committee, you're on Agricultural Committee, and the person on the Agricultural Committee wants billions to go to the agricultural states. You know, why should somebody who, who's in New York care? You go to the person who's in New York, you say, you're on Financial Services, I'm on Agriculture, let's deal. And this is how you get the benefits. And, right, and those who have seniority on those committees can leverage these deals. And if you destroy this important property interest, right, you would have destroyed a lot of the motivation as to why these committees and why these things are set up in the first place. And this is very difficult. So I don't think they're going to be willingly, uh, willing just to throw it away like the way we propose. And I just think the incentives for them to do it um, are going to be very rare. Like when we think of it as, again, you think it should be a voter-generated thing, right? We may think it's voter-generated, but as I said again, for each member of Congress who gets elected, each one of them, each voter can come up and say, I think Congress, you're doing a really bad job. Congress isn't doing well, you're destroying the country. But for each of their legislators who turns to them and says, I will get you jobs, they vote, right? Even if it's at the expense of the national interest. And this is the problem. Now, I don't want to overstate the obstacle that surrounds this, right? But I do think and I do think there are incentives sometimes that members of Congress might have to engage in term limits or not to obey the seniority thing, uh, uh, norm very strongly. One of the things that I think House Speaker Gingrich tried to do was try to undermine that seniority goal. But when you combine the elimination of term limits and a veil of ignorance, that's random assignments together, you're literally hitting at two sides of the motivation. So, one is a term limit will hit at the re-election motivation. Random assignment will make it difficult for party leaders to choose the people they want to be on these committees, right? So if I'm, if, even if I don't buy into the seniority norm, or you don't want the seniority norm, that is as Newt Gingrich opposed, one thing he would want as a party leader is the right to appoint people on the committee that are party loyalists. And if you put in the random assignment, that doesn't help him. So the question is, who would be the constituents in the Congress that want, would want both a random assignment and a term limit? And I can't think of any constituency that would say this is good for us. Right? I can understand why Newt Gingrich may not be, want the seniority norm, where a party leader who wants party discipline may not want the seniority norm. Right? By the way, just with respect to appropriations, it's going to be a classic example of this. If you remember when Robert Livingston was appointed to that committee, he wasn't the ranking uh, 
a Republican on that committee who was number five in seniority. And they had gone all the way down to number five because the top four, one was under indictment, one didn't get, get into that, but the, the top four just didn't meet the test of what he wanted. And so he ignored the seniority norm and pointed it. But what I'm just going to say is that it's very hard to have both. I don't think you're going to get any kind of motivation to get both of them together. So I, I, I'm doubtful that you can get both of these reforms. Now, I just wanted to say one thing about random assignment is that hypothetically, imagine that you did get it, that there was some kind of upsweeping public sentiments and people just went to the polls and said, we want reform now. You have to think about what's going to happen. Let's say if you're a congressperson from Queens, New York, and you get randomly assigned to the Agricultural Committee and maybe the Armed Service Committee. By the way, I don't think there's any military base in Queens, New York, but I may be wrong. So there's no military base. And let's discount this new rage for urban farming, right? There are really no farms, right, in Queens, New York. So you're going to get a constituent that's going to say, what are you doing on the Agricultural Committee? Why are you not on the Financial Services Committee? And the member of Congress will say, well, there was a reform movement two years ago or a year ago, and now I'm randomly assigned. And they're going to say, can you vote to change that rule? And he's going to say, well, why not? We can make rules for our own proceedings. And they're going to say, vote to change it. Put yourself on the Financial Services Committee or we're going to throw you out. That is very likely going to be the sequence because he's not going to do any good for them. Telling them that this will help the national interest if I serve on the Agriculture Committee a, a, a congressperson from Queens is just not going to persuade the people from Queens who sent you to Congress. They want you on the Financial Services Committee, right? And the people from Iowa who are now on the Financial Services Committee, they're going to have their constituency saying, why are you not on the Agriculture Committee, right? Change the rules that don't enable you to be on the Agriculture. I just don't think the voters at the constituent level would want this kind of random. A situation. Those committees serve certain kinds of things for them. Now, I just want to say one thing very quickly. There were reforms that took place, but if um, you can correct me, uh, maybe Bill Crystal uh, remembers this a little bit, but I think in 1994 there, the mission was to eliminate a third of all committees. That was the promise that was made on the contract with America. Now, they eliminated three. And I, I mean, this is a Republican driven initiative, I think, largely, I think it was post office. I think the District of Columbia Committee, um, and I'm thinking one had to do with Marines, right? A Merchant Marine Committee or something like that. Uh, uh, it wasn't kind of, uh, with the District of Columbia, you can understand why that one went very quickly. Um, now, I, I'm just going to suggest these were not, it didn't end up delivering the kind of bold initiatives you wanted, but these were three. I just want to say something. David Dreyer, who was marshaled to go and <laughs> and be the reform agent. Um, when he did this, right, there was a lot of enthusiasm. Afterwards, he claimed, and well, we can take it for a grain of salt, that when he went to eat, he usually ate alone. Uh, and he said the way some people treated him, especially Republican leaders, they treated him, and this was his own words, as if he had taken their firstborn child, right? And he just suggested this, is not, this was a really, really hard thing. And what did he end up doing? He ended up eliminating three. They ended up eliminating three committees. There were some changes. Yes, you know, they didn't buy into the seniority system. But generally speaking, the re-election, the integrity of the jurisdictions remained intact. And I just want to say something. Many people may think, well, appropriations is not like uh, the Agricultural Committee. It's about spending money generally. Appropriations has subcommittees that map on to all those standing jurisdictional committees. And those, if you go through each one of those subcommittees and you go to the agricultural subcommittee, it's filled with farming state people. The financial services one is filled with people working in financial services. It has the same kind of jurisdictional people self-select onto the subcommittees and appropriations that align with the interests of their constituents. And I just don't see why any member of Congress who goes into Congress, regardless of what's driving them, would give up something so sweet for the general interest of the public, right? And the expense of the lovely people from their jurisdiction or constituency who put them there in the first place. And I'll end it at that. Okay. Yeah.
Well, it's good to be here with so many friends from the Federal Society, an organization I've been tangentially associated with, I guess, since its beginning, and for almost 30 years now, and which I admire very much. Uh, it's great to be here with Judge Jones, whom I got to know a little bit um, in somewhat melancholy circumstances, I guess, in 1990 when uh, Judge Jones was under consideration for the Supreme Court vacancy. I was Dan Quayle's chief of staff. We spent some time together in the White House. I remember, I think it was a Saturday where uh, there was sort of private interviews going on, I guess, you'd, uh, by the president of the finalists. And um, I don't think I'm revealing any secrets here when I say that uh, Vice President Quayle actually strongly argued for Judge Jones for that seat. He, was, uh, he lost that argument. Um, Judge Souter was appointed, and history went in a different direction. <laughs> A less, uh, less good. I mean, I've often thought it's an interesting historical sort of the contingency of events. I mean, if, if Bob Bork, I mean, I've always thought the 87 defeat of Bork was a huge, obviously, uh, huge un injustice and defeat for people who believed in, in constitutional government and, and in relimiting government um, and in rethinking uh, the role of the courts, but also um, a big defeat for the conservative movement in the sense that it really showed that the Reagan administration was sort of running out of steam and out of clout. It certainly set back efforts to change the federal judiciary for quite a long time, if you think about the effect of that. But one effect of the Bork defeat in 87 was, I think, the uh, nervousness about taking on uh, a tough fight in 1990, which I do think contributed to the nomination of Souter. Um, and one reason for the Bork defeat, of course, was the election of 86 when the Democrats took back the Senate. Um, so if we had had better Republican Senate candidates in 1986, and those were some pretty close races that, that caused the Republicans to lose the Senate, the whole history of uh, constitutional law could have been different, actually, for the last 25 years. It does prove that elections matter, actually, I would say. Something worth rem remembering as we go into the next year. Um, the, uh, I'm a skeptic, actually, about Steve's, uh, Steve and I work together for, for Dan Quayle, so I hate to throw him under the bus here, but hey, it's, <laughs> it's Washington, so, you know, it's, uh, I'm a skeptic about Steve's reforms. I mean, I've become a little bit skeptical about all these kinds of reforms. I, I was a supporter of term limits. I debated, I think, under the auspices of the Federalist Society. I have this vague memory that this was in Austin, but I don't know why I think this. Uh, I debated Nelson Polsby, I think, around 92, the very distinguished late political scientist from Berkeley, um, on term limits, and I made the case for them. He told me they're going to, they were foolish and would be counterproductive, and in any case, wouldn't make much of a difference. I think the data on the state level, as Bill suggests, um, suggests that Nelson was more right than I was in my hopes. Now, the federal government's different from the state government, and you can make a case that if the court hadn't thrown out uh, federal term limits in 95, we could be looking at a different situation at the, um, at, the, at the national level. But, you know, we do have some data, from thanks to federalism, of comparisons among states, and it doesn't seem to have made much difference, and the differences that it's made have maybe been in a slightly negative direction in terms of, of curtailing uh, the growth of government, of curtailing the various uh, pathologies of modern sort of welfare state liberalism. California would be a good instance of that. We have a little data on the committee. I don't know. Someone should go look and see if any states do limit committee. Um, maybe Steve has uh, committee assignments and rotate them more than the federal than the National Congress does. Uh, this is a testable proposition. I do think if one were going to make this case, if Steve wants to really advance this agenda, let's tr advance it in a few states. It's probably easier to get it done in, in some states than at the federal level and see if it makes much of a difference. I'd be a little skeptical. Um, the Intelligence Committee is term limited in Congress. I think six years, for all members, not just for chairman, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think people think the Intelligence Committee is a particularly better committee in terms of aggressive oversight or fresh faces and all that than other committees. Now, intelligence is a peculiar field, so maybe it doesn't show much. Um, the, the Appropriations Committees are a problem, but I think they're a problem for bigger reasons than who's on them. Um, small states, it's not an accident, incidentally, that Byrd, uh, in a way, Stevens, all the great appropriators are from small states. I mean, this is a way small states get power to go on appropriations committees. It's a, in a weird way, it's a product of, of, of federalism in, 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 the, uh, in, in the Senate. Um, I, I'm not sure that would change much under Steve's proposal in either the Senate or the House. I mean, if you take that Queens congressman um, that you were talking about who would go on the Ag Committee, well, what would actually happen 
and we have some experience of this in other air policy areas. If your own constituents don't care about an issue, but you're on a committee that has a lot of power on that issue, you will be even more heavily lobbied by interest groups. They will race to capture you. You know, the ethanol industry will race against whoever the ethanol industry's com Madisonian competitors are in the interest group firmament uh, to capture you. You can get more captured if you have no actual constituents who care about something, not less captured. I mean, sophisticated lobbyists know this. You go after people on committees, not people who have big businesses or relevant industries or population groups in their districts. They tend to more naturally represent the interests of their district, which incidentally is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we do believe in representative <laughs> government. I mean, it's why I very much dislike, incidentally, Steve, the comparison to judges. I mean, judges are not supposed to do the same thing as representatives are supposed to do, and it's not illegitimate to come to Congress and advocate, you know, and represent the interests of your farmers or your constituents of whatever points of view they have, whatever interests they have. No, it shouldn't be distorted, I agree, and, and there are reforms one can think of to try to limit the effect of a kind of overzealous and over-effective interest group representation. But I don't think, honestly, if you had rotation of committees, the Queen representative would become a sudden uh, recipient of huge contributions from different ag groups. Um, he would have no particular countervailing pressure except for the other. It would become a pure bidding war in a way that it isn't quite now, but presumably if you're from a certain part of the country, you represent at least the interests of the farmers in that part of the country, and there's a more natural correlation, you might say, between your, your, your legislative and appropriating activities and your actual, and your actual constituents. Um, I'm, I'm generally skeptical of this kind of micro-reform, though, would be my bigger point. I mean, you can try to change, to relimit government by changing the incentives and the behavior of congressmen. I think that's very, very hard. We've tried that with campaign finance reform. We've tried it with term limits at the state level. Um, we've tried it with all kinds of ethical restrictions on dealing with lobbyists and staff going out, you know, revolving door issues. That is one way to think about how to reform the federal government. The other way, which I'm much more sympathetic to, they're not mutually exclusive, but the other way is to change the overall rules of the game, let's call it macro reform, which just constrains what these guys can do. Don't change their personal, you're not going to change them, you know, they're not going to become angels, um, and therefore th there are limits on how much you're going to change what they try to do in Congress, but if you can't spend more than you take in, if the Fed can't print money to f endlessly uh, fund deficits, um, if, uh, um, if earmarks really could be prohibited or you could change the overall macro budget process in a way that it's much harder for appropriators to stick things in that benefit very narrow or targeted constituencies. Um, I think that's a more promising way to relimit government than to sort of go after the actual staff or, or terms uh, or committee assignments of the individual representatives. So they're not mutually exclusive, and I'm not entirely against all the efforts to change the way representatives behave. I just think the macro change in the rules of the road for government would have a lot more effect and would be worth much more if one wants to really m more, more effort. I mean, one, there really needs to be a, re a fresh thinking constitutionally about how to relimit a semi-unlimited government that we've created over the years, and how to deal with the pathologies of the welfare state, of the entitlement state, of the crony capitalist state. But I think the way we'll end up dealing with that will have much more to do with the macro budget rules, legislative rules, uh, fiscal rules that we have that we can impose on Congress or that Congress can impose on itself than on uh, the ways in which legislators apportion themselves to committees or receive campaign finance contributions or, or, or the like. I, also, I want to be uh, also, uh, since I'm, uh, I don't want to simply leave the impression that I'm throwing Steve under the bus, so I want to make clear I also disagree with Bill's proposed reforms, which <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm, I'm actually sort of uh, mostly, I think I agree with him on the judicial filibuster. We've published things in the magazine criticizing the judicial filibuster as not having the same rationale, really, as the real, fil the real filibuster's rationale is anti-majoritarian, preserving, you know, preventing legislation from being rushed through, preserving the rights of minorities when there's a kind of attempt to overwhelm them. It's a little hard to see how that rationale appeals to uh, quite, uh, it doesn't fit neatly, let's say, on filibustering judicial appointments. Um, you could stretch it to make it fit, but I, I'm inclined to agree on the judicial appointment side, but not to agree on the legislative side. 
there are parts of, you could imagine tinkering with the filibuster to make it harder to filibuster certain kinds of legislation as opposed to others. That is, it seems to me, it seems to me straightforward authorizing legislation is the classic example where you want 60 votes, where there's a very good anti-majoritarian case to make, you shouldn't be able to make major, major changes in, you know, health care or, or labor law or a whole bunch of other things without having little more than 51 votes and 218 votes. Uh, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't want to maybe limit filibuster when it comes to appropriations bills. And we do limit it on the budget, of course. And incidentally, it's just not true. I mean, I will predict right now, if, if a Republican wins the presidency and Republicans control both houses, Obamacare will be repealed. They'll do a lot of it on reconciliation. And it, as a true matter of political, um, and, and honestly, it's a true matter of political capital. I just don't think you could, it, it's going to be a huge issue in 2012. If the Republican wins, it's going to be very hard for four or six or eight or nine Democrats in the Senate to stand in the way of what was, would have been the main, one of the main agenda items on which a president would have been elected and on which a, a, a Republican House and Senate would have been elected. So I, I think we overstate sometimes the power of the filibuster. It certainly didn't stop uh, either the, well, the stimulus wasn't even really tried to, be, to filibuster. It didn't stop Obamacare either. Um, it stopped card check and it stopped cap and trade or the threat of it did, which was a good thing. Otherwise, we would have much more, we'd have negative economic growth instead of extremely slow economic growth. So I'm perfectly happy to defend the use of the filibuster over the last couple of years. But again, I think that's another case where I think it's less important than the bigger rethinking of and relimiting of the role of the federal, of the federal government. Um, Finally, it's, it's a great, of course, honor to be on a panel with all these law professors. I'm, I'm glad to see law professors are keeping their morale up, despite the miserable, miserable performance of one of them in the White House. Um, <laughs> how, could I, I can't, how could I resist, you know? <laughs> Especially with that really ridiculous, Bill's ridiculously unself-reflective phrase of the federal judiciary. I was like on a, a, with a bunch of lawyers and on a panel of law professors and a judge. Uh, he courageously proclaims Congress to be horribly broken, but the place where you really get value for your money is the federal courts, you know? <laughs> I, could, I, can, I could easily... Uh, I'm not at all convinced that the federal judiciary has done so much a better job in the last 30 or 40 years than the executive branch or the... Uh, or the legislative branch. And whatever you say about the Republican field, and no one's been... I was say no one. Well, I've been fairly critical of it and certainly disappointed. I've tried to get a whole bunch of people to run who, who aren't running. Um, the only, the good news about the Republican field is there's no law professor running. <laughs> and it's, I want, one last thing, just while I'm diverting from the actual topic here. The, um, I gather Marco Rubio had, had a very successful and impressive speech here the other night. I'm a big fan of his, and I did actually in my despair after the last Republican debate, thinking about how things might go different in an interesting way. Here's a scenario I'll take 45 seconds to lay out for you. Um, Gingrich wins Iowa, sort of narrowly, I would say, in a very, you know, splintered field. Romney comes back, comes back and wins New Hampshire, but with, unimpressively, Huntsman gets some more votes. Gingrich, uh, Kane, Perry hangs around. Uh, South Carolina, which is then on the Saturday, the 21st uh, of January, is a total splinter. I was down there Thursday night. It seems to me no one in South Carolina actually knows who they were for, so that goes, you know, 21, 19, 18, 16, 14, something like that. Everyone's in utter, the whole field's in chaos. Everyone's in despair. And then on January 23rd, that's when Rubio has to be drafted to run for the presidency. And the way it happens is Florida is the next primary on January 31st. You can't get on the ballot at that point, but you could have a write-in campaign for Rubio. Rubio wins Florida in a write-in on January 31st, and Republicans have a slightly more inspiring nominee than they look like they're going to have now. So I, I leave you with that thought. These are law professors who have no idea how this works. I, I completely agree with the sentiments on Marco Rubio. I'll endorse him uh, enthusiastically if he should, he should ever decide to run. Um, just a couple of quick points in rebuttal, since uh, I believe everyone on the panel disagreed with me, at least somewhat, and in some cases, very much. Um, 
First, and in response to uh, Bill Crystal's point about members of Congress being supposed to represent their districts, there's a sense in which that's true, but there's also a sense in which members of Congress are supposed to be officers of the national government and to look out for the interests of the whole country. Under the Articles of Confederation, members of Congress could be recalled at any time by a state legislature. They were term limited and their salaries were paid by the states. The framers deliberately changed that to give representatives a fixed term in office, make them not subject to recall or instruction by the states, and pay them a salary out of the national treasury. So I think members of Congress do represent their districts and states, but they're also supposed to represent all the rest of us. Um, that leads to the next point, which is uh, Bill uh, criticized the term limits proposal that I put forward in a number of ways. I don't agree with him. Um, I guess uh, the closest I would come to, say, to uh, harmonizing my position with Bill's is I've come to think term limits for service in the House and Senate itself may be a bad idea and that all that's needed is term limits for service on committees. But I should mention Bill did not say anything that uh, I recall about the idea of random assignment of members to committees. And you could perfectly well have vacancies on committees and randomly assign members rather than letting members self-select to be on committees that, uh, that they're concerned with. Uh, both Bill and Shide said that uh, it's a, it'll be impossible to get the House or the Senate to adopt a rule of this kind. Well, I did a quick count, and by my count, there are 44 representatives on the House Appropriations Committee and 435 representatives in the House of Representatives as a whole. If, this, if term limits for committee membership were approached piecemeal, and first imposed on the appropriations committees and the tax and, uh, and the, finance, the Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, then a majority of senators and a majority of representatives might have an interest in term limiting appropriators and tax writers because they could then serve on those committees themselves. So that could change the dynamic in terms of making a partial term limit process uh, foreseeable. Um, the final thing I'd note is that um, to adopt term limits for House and Senate committees and random assignment of members to Senate and House committees, all you need is 51 percent of the House and 51 percent of the Senate. It's just a simple majority vote to change, uh, to change the rules. So you don't have to work your way through the Article 5 amendment process, which is so hard to do. Obviously, in an ordinary year, it would be hard to get members to do something like that. But if somebody runs on a campaign uh, like the Contract with America, which House Republicans ran, ran on in 1994, and if they make as part of their Contract with America an idea that Appropriations Committee members and Ways and Means and Finance Committee members will be term limited and as members will be assigned randomly to those committees, they could come to office with a mandate to do that and in a circumstance where it could really happen. Thanks. I think these may be on now. I think this is on. Oh, is this on? Is this on? Yeah. Oh, it actually is on. Uh, let me just say a few words. Um, Bill Crystal has sort of pushed the law professors together so we'll be like the Ted Stevens and Robert Byrd. Let me say uh, one uh, other good thing that Stephen did not think of, and I think, Bill, you've given us an empirical base now, which I actually find very cogent. Uh, so we have the uh, Appropriations Committee, which is not term limited, uh, and the Intelligence Committee that is. Well, how much has each of these committees cost us in rent seeking? The Appropriations Committee, it's in the trillions. If you look over a 10-year period, Intelligence Committee, a drop in the bucket. So based upon that empirical comparison, Steve, I think uh, you have uh, the beginning of an argument. I also like Steve's suggestion that you could limit your proposal to maybe just appropriations and the tax committees. And I think it would be more attractive. 
Now, you still would have, if, with due respect, and even though I'm now your ally, um, I'm a friendly, critical ally, and you still would have the hydraulic problem, in my opinion. And the hydraulic problem is that the lobbyists are going to swarm on whoever it is. And you're just redistributing lobbyist power. And, and so I think that's a, a micro-reform that's, that's not going to work. And Steve, I don't think the random assignment helps too much, uh, it, but it would produce the wonderful incongruity of, say, the Bronx legislator who ends up being chair of the Agriculture Committee. And for her re-election, she's funded by agribusinesses from Mississippi and Wyoming. Now, that would be really neat, but I don't believe that would improve our government uh, at all. Uh, and moreover, I would say that the problem identified with state term limits comes back in spades uh, once you do that. Because a lot of these committees actually do require some expertise to, to keep from being completely dominated by the staff, to get non-lawyers on the Judiciary Committee, which we have occasionally, and to get people on the tax committees who can't do numbers, which is probably most of the House of Representatives, uh, I think would greatly exacerbate what's been documented at the state level that term limits are going to increase the power of staff and the executive department uh, at the expense of uh, congressional uh, oversight. Now, I will defend my proposition uh, to the death uh, that when you look at the three branches of government, Bill, with all due respect, uh, and even though you and I agree on almost everything else, uh, with all due respect, I think we get great value from the judiciary. Uh, and I don't see the judicial filibuster as the greatest threat to the republic. But I, I would like everybody in the panel, I think everybody in the panel actually should agree that this has not been a productive enterprise, uh, starting with Miguel Estrada and moving now through Judge Victoria Nurse, who's been nominated to serve with Frank Easterbrook. Um, or even, say, uh, uh, a Republican is elected next year, say if you wanted Frank Easterbrook on the Supreme Court, which I would actually quite support. Well, good luck getting that through a judicial filibuster if the Democrats choose to filibuster it. Uh, and on the Affordable Care Act, remember President Clinton, you, people have short memories on these things. Bill Clinton was elected on national health insurance in 1992. Uh, the Democrats had the Senate, the Democrats had the House in 1992, uh, and they were not able to get it through uh, for a variety of reasons. One reason was they didn't have a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate. Uh, and even if you get through repeal of affordable care, there could be more than seven or eight Democrats in the Senate after the 92 election. It's mathematically impossible to eliminate all of them. So even if you're able to get affordable health care through, you'll have to make a deal with the Democrats. Uh, and that deal will come with a very expensive price tag if you're able to get it through. So it's going to be very complicated, but the filibuster, I think, significantly raises the costs of government along a lot of dimensions. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say something very quickly. Um, the sort of notion of throwing Steve under the bus, um, a lot of us have vested interest in not doing that. One of um, my concern is that beyond being a friend, he's a colleague, so I have a special uh, <laughs> probably incentive. And I, I wanted to say some things that are actually uh, just coming to the implementation aspect, certain things that I think may work and may not work uh, uh, for your goals. One is, I do think the term limitation, that you can find a motivational story on appropriations where it might work, right? A reformist party who comes in, like, the, in, like in, in 19, like what you faced with the 1994 Republicans when they proposed a reform, and a lot of freshmen came in, not particularly enamored of seniority because they don't have seniority, so they want to be, and one of the things that Gingrich did is that he put a lot of probably more freshmen uh, congressmen on the Appropriations Committee than has ever, I think, occurred. Um, in our history. And one of the things that I think is important, though, is that you want to preserve the party leader's power. And you destroy that when you have random assignment. Because if you want reform, you want to be able to say, we elected you for reform, and if you don't deliver it, we kick you out. And they have to turn back and say, well, if you want us to carry through the reform, we have to instill party discipline. And we, to instill party discipline, we have to have, the speaker has to have right over appointments. And if you, but if you remove the right over appointments, I think you're more likely going to get the scenario that I think 
uh, Will and, and Bill referred to, which is that you, you're just going to get random people in assignment who are going to be bought off by interest groups uh, from other constituencies. And the last thing I want to say a little bit in favor is the question of term limits. I think uh, Bill referred to some empirical evidence that suggests that it's not happening. Well, it, it depends on what you're looking at. Uh, take the point of view of Barry Goldwater, who I think, uh, and I think this is true, he, he said that his interest is not necessarily making government more efficient or in limiting it. Um, and if you take the perspective that you're not trying to improve the efficiency of these legislatures, their competence, their knowledge, their ability to deliver goods, but you want to limit government, the incentive of re-election, I think there have been studies on, on the 15 state legislatures, and one thing they have shown is that, that the re-election motive is stronger in those non-term limited states than those where you have term limitation. And that the term limited legislators have more policy motivated legislators. People who come in specifically who say we're not here for a career, but we're here to specific, specifically perform a certain policy agenda. Now this is based upon surveys of legislatures in both term and non-term and limited, right, as to what their goals are. So you can take that with a grain of salt, but I think that's sort of something in that direction. Well, just two, two uh, quick points. I just, we'll see in 2013 if the Republicans win, whether Bill Eskridge or I am uh, I'm right, but I'm, I'm pretty confident I'm going to be right. I, look, in 93, 94, I was in the middle of that fight. The disaster for the Clinton administration was they couldn't get the bill passed through the House. I believe it would have been very, very hard to filibuster in the Senate, actually. I mean, I believe me, there was a huge amount of nervousness among Republicans about taking on a new president with his top legislative priority. It took a lot of work to get Republicans to even oppose it, but the thing that they, they, they control the House of Representatives, think about this in retrospect, it's kind of amazing. Democrats control the House of Representatives. Tom Foley and Dick Gephardt were actually good leaders, I mean competent leaders, uh, and they could not get the bill through the House. If they had passed it through the House, it would have been very hard for, for uh, um, 45 Republicans or whatever there were in 94 to, to stop it in the Senate. And the reason I said seven or eight is that you don't need to get all the Democrats, you just need to get enough to break, to go to 60. I think it's very, very hard for Democrats, the Democrats who would have been elected in states that the Republican would have carried in 12 to filibuster uh, such a central part of, the, of, a, of the agenda of a new president. So I think it will be, if Republicans win, I think they'll repeal health care. If they don't win, they, they won't. On the um, more central issue of, I think, appropriate, look, I mean, this, these are all, the, the, what's happened in Congress and the re power relationships among the different committees of Congress and between the appropriators and the authorizers are sort of complicated issues, actually. I'm not sure, for example, do we want party leaders to be stronger or weaker? In the old days, when they were much weaker, when there were these congressional barons who ran committees, regardless of what committee party leaders thought, the Wilbur Millses of the world and the Richard Russells, well, it was certainly not, there's an awful lot of pork being dispensed, and there were probably unwise decisions being made. On the other hand, we didn't have a massively out of control federal government, you could argue. And I would argue that's because in the old days, there was not constitutionally mandated, but an understanding that you really couldn't run much of an unbalanced budget. There was, not, there was, in fact, a gold standard or a quasi-gold standard, which made it very hard to even think about how you would fund endless deficits. We weren't quite the reserve currency. In the, uh, a fiat currency being a reserve currency, I think, is a huge problem for limited government. Uh, and there were other norms in place, just uh, in terms of just general understanding of what government should do, obviously, and federalism and other things, that, and there wasn't the modern welfare state that, that led to what it's been led to. So I, it's not clear to me, I mean, again, if you want to just be empirical, the, the rise of the party leadership has not been particularly correlated or the strength of the party leadership of the speaker hasn't exactly correlated with the relimiting of government. The relation of the appropriate, the appropriators, I'm not a big fan of the appropriators and I'm happy to beat them up. I would just point out empirically that the huge growth of government and the huge threat of the debt and the deficit is not mostly from, from legislation passed by the appropriations committees, it's from entitlements. So, I mean, we, you know, we can spend a huge amount of time tweaking the appropriators to get their the rate of growth of what they control in discretionary spending down, but it's not actually the fundamental place where growth has happened over the last 15, 20 years. On the Intelligence Committee, this was sort of half a joking thing, I mean, on my part and Bill's part, but actually, if you want to be just empirical about it, the intelligence, and they only have oversight, they don't have the appropriators, but actually, growth in spending, it's black, I mean, we don't know the exact number, I don't think, but the growth in spending on intelligence has gone up faster with the, under the supervision of the term limited and rotated intelligence committee uh, uh, oversight than the growth of most uh, domestic or foreign discretionary spending. So again, I don't, just don't see much correlation one way or the other. 
between these appointments. And I think the problem of the Queen's congressman getting funded by agribusiness isn't just a theoretical problem. It happens in certain areas of Congress. It's not like all these committees are entirely filled with people from the relevant geographical areas. And go look at what defense, con I mean, I'll take part of government that I don't think should be shrunk, defense. Go look at where defense contractors, look at their contributions to people not in their district, <laughs> who are not in big defense states or hawkish states, but who happen to end up on armed services, because the Armed Services Committee is not entirely full of people from you know, uh, military dis districts with bases or districts with contractors. And those votes are often as reliable as the votes of people from, you know, who represent you know, Camp Pendleton or, 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 or Fort Drum or whatever. So I mean, I just think as a practical matter, both the random assignment and the term limits would be a very dubious utility if we're look if what we're trying to do is limit a certain kind of rent seeking and interest group focused legislation and appropriations. All right, I think it's I think it's time to turn it over to questions. We'll alternate between the mics. You first, sir. Oh well, speak loudly. We can okay. hear you. I can do that. Uh, James Young, National Foundation. Um, Mr. Matt, how are you really against Mr. Madison here? Uh, we're, we're dealing, it seems to me that the proposal, and I guess I'm the chorus beating up on you, Steve, sorry, uh, is the problem is that we're, we're dealing with the symptom, not the disease. It's like treating a fever for pneumocystis pneumonia. The patient's got AIDS. You don't treat that. The problem here is exceeding Article 1, Section 8, and the powers, uh, the limitations stated in that. Uh, yes, isn't that, uh, are we really, isn't this supposedly a, a, an effort to treat that symptom rather than focus on the disease of government which is far exceeded its constitutional authority? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think government has far exceeded its constitutional authority. It's spending money on all sorts of things that it is, ought not to be uh, spending money on. Um, some of the entitlement programs that Bill Crystal mentioned may not go through the appropriations committees, but I guess I believe Social Security is handled by the Ways and Means Committee, and that's a committee that one would think about term limiting and having random assignment to along with the appropriations committees. Um, you mentioned Madison Federalist 10, and I'm a huge fan of Madison Federalist 10. I think that it's true that um, the nationally elected institutions will tend to be more just and less faction-based than uh, state or local institutions. So the advantage of random assignment of members to committees is that it moves the committees toward the mean member of Congress, the average member of Congress, and away from members of Congress who, because of their district or stake, have some unusual non-national interest in things. And I would also say, uh, I think Bill Crystal mentioned that uh, random assignment and term limits would weaken the committees relative to the executive branch. They w I think it would, and I'm all in favor of that. I think the executive branch, because the president is elected by a national majority, tends to be more moderate on questions of law execution than the agriculture committees or the labor committees, which are more captured by special interests. So I actually think the Madison Federalist 10 argument points toward moving committee members toward the mean member of Congress and away from uh, districts and states. Right. Over there, please. We don't have a microphone. Maybe we can take a question there and then let... We can hear you fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Roland Mueller. Uh, I served as a committee counsel for the uh, Leon House administration for 14 years. So I saw a little bit of the dysfunction that uh, people are talking about. I like to say that I saw the, the place go from principal to pork in 10 years. But my question is, everybody seems to be talking about the lack of accountability uh, of Congress to the, the country as a whole, accountability only to districts. And I'd be interested in a panelist's response to this idea for improving accountability. We know that the founders wrote into Article 5 the idea that states, as well as Congress, could propose an amendment to the Constitution. But it's not workable because states are afraid of a runaway convention. Well, suppose that a majority of states with a majority of electoral votes passed a state law 
that allowed them to recall any delegates to a convention, a constitutional convention, that ignored their instructions to limit that convention to an up or down vote on a single amendment. And suppose also that 13 of those states passed a state constitutional amendment that made it unconstitutional in that state for that state to consider or ratify any amendment from a runaway convention. Now, if states didn't fear a runaway convention, then they would be free to use the Article 5 power. And since Congress will almost never call a convention, the Board of Directors never calls a meeting of the stockholders if they can help it, then if states give Congress a choice between proposing the amendment that 34 of them identically propose and calling a convention, Congress will propose the amendment. If states can propose an amendment, Congress wakes up every day terrified of the states, which is probably the state of mind they should be in. And I'm interested in your reactions to this idea for empowering the states, as Madison intended them to be, to make Congress more accountable, maybe make a balanced budget amendment possible. Interesting to me. Yeah, I'm very interested in, in that idea. I'd have to think a lot more about the various specifics that you outlined, which, which are quite detailed. Um, one of the ways in which people have gotten Congress to reform in the past is with threat of a constitutional convention. Um, the change to direct election of senators happened in part because there was fear of a constitutional convention. So um, I think that is potentially an important tool and something that can be mobilized. I also think that when there is a particularly heated election with major issues on the table of the kind we're going to see in 2012, people will be looking for bold proposals from both sides. And Republicans have proposed ending earmarks, and we've made a lot of progress with the earmark issue. I think proposing random assignment and term limits for the appropriations and taxing committees in Congress might be something like that as well. Uh, I like the idea as well, but I think you're going to have a hard time, to give you practical advice from an academic oxymoron, you might have a hard time <laughs> motivating the states to gin up the political effort to introduce such a constitutional amendment. Uh, you'd almost certainly have to bundle it with something more than just committee term limits and random assignment. That is not an issue that thrills the heart of state legislators, particularly state legislators who resent the term limits that they already see, right? Although they might be more obviously amenable to it at the federal level. Uh, I think you'd want to combine that with maybe a bigger proposal, maybe a balanced budget amendment or something like that. So you could bundle, maybe you could have a series of two or three constitutional amendments. That would be consistent with your idea. They could be limited to considering maybe two or three or four or five proposals that would be linked in that way and then see what happens when they, when they get together. Although, again, uh, I am a critic from an academic point of view, even for the bigger proposals. I mean, we, we've, we've had balanced budget statutes like Graham-Rudman, and it's not clear how much difference they made. Uh, we've had balanced budget constitutional requirements at the state level. Most states have that. Um, and I think it has made a difference, but it's not made as big a difference as one might have uh, expected. And you still have states like California, which are maybe more runaway than the federal government, yet they do operate under a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. So the hydraulic problem is a very powerful problem, even for the bigger proposals. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with, with much of that. But I would say just I'm a little. I think we should pause and before it's just assuming that the the excessive representativeness of these representatives to local pressures is the biggest problem we face. I just don't think that's empirically the case. Congress has slowed down the Obama administration, not sped up their attempt to spend more money and concentrate power. That's just a fact. I mean, if they controlled Congress more than they did, if Pelosi were a stronger leader than, sh than she is, if there hadn't been local constituents who objected to a lot of things like card check, which made it very, very hard for a Democratic senator, let's say, even when they had a 60 vote in the Senate, which they did, let me remind everyone, went sp from Specter's defection through November, uh, through Scott Brown's election at least, but the fact that Mark Warner is a Democratic senator from a right-to-work state made it very hard to pass card check. Now, is that a bad thing, necessarily, from the point of view of limited government? I'm much less 
convinced that the problem here is that these representatives are, there's a narrower problem, which is a kind of earmark appropriation special interest problem. In the big picture of the runaway federal government, the uh, out of control nanny state, um, the entitlement state, I'm less convinced that that is really the core of the problem. And so I don't know that we should be spending, I mean, we can do some things to correct the, particularly the appropriations, the way appropriations works, but I'm not convinced this is the fundamental problem we face. And I'm worried that fixes we make to make congressmen less representative of local interests or less uh, sensitive to local interests could actually have the opposite effect. It will create a quasi-parliamentary system, which incidentally, if you want random assignment of committee members, look at the, look at parliament. Incredibly weak committees, people, are so, I don't know if it's literally randomly assigned, but it's very close to it. And I don't know, is, is, do most of the European parliamentary systems with non-local based representatives and non-strong, not strong parliamentary committees, do they check uh, big government more effectively than the American system? I'm, I'm doubtful about that. I, I was going to just say, I think the real pathology is the bridge to nowhere situation. Where you I disagree have with that. The bridge to nowhere is by no means the biggest problem we face. It's not empirically the biggest spending problem we face. It's a stupid thing. In fact, it's not that hard to even turn it over when it goes out of control. It's going to be cut back. Earmarks are being cut back. And that, that is, in fact, the more traditional Madisonian form uh, of the price you pay for an interest group based federalist representative system. If that, if, 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 if that traditional price we pay, and I'm for curbing it, don't get me wrong, and I'm happy to have people campaign against it and think about ways of changing uh, legislative rules and other things to make it harder to do that, but that is not actually the fundamental problem. That is the traditional American, you know, slight amount of waste and excess that you get from the federalist representative interest group based system we have, but it's not the fundamental problem of the modern welfare state, I don't think. Bill, I assume you would agree with the insight of Madison's Federalist 10 that smaller geographic units practicing democracy are more likely to have turbulent politics and special interest capture than an extended commercial republic. And isn't that exactly what's at play on these House committees and Senate committees? You have districts and states with very small atypical uh, groups of citizens, and you get uh, a, an outcome it's very different from what the outcome would be of a mean, the mean member of Congress or of a 51% national majority. No, what Madison objects to is too much power resting in these local communities, the ability to particularly violate minority rights. Um, the notion that the interest groups would fight it out on a bigger stage is something Madison generally is thought to have approved of, and the system he helped set up facilitates, and then the choice becomes, in the real world, the choice between that, which has its own deficiencies and problems, the rent-seeking, you know, hydraulic, you know, lobbyist kind of problem is, of course, the, the key, the, 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 one of the key problems of that system, but compared to what? Is what the implication of what you just said is that the perfect solution, then, is a pure majoritarian parliamentary system. I mean, when you get rid of all this local, you get rid of all these local pressures, and you just have these parties that run on platforms and then implement them. And I'm, I'm more hostile to that than to the Madisonian system. John. Steve, thanks for provoking a fascinating conversation and some deep thinking on how to fix some of these structural problems. But it, 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 I think um, Bill Crystal's comment about um, the incentives are not lined up, right, goes more to the heart of it than, than your particular proposals. Uh, and, and your answer to how we could get this through is one that appealed to an interest that would perpetuate the problem. Well, a lot of uh, other people who are not on the Appropriations Committee would have a vested interest in adopting this rule so that they can grab the rent-seeking themselves. And, and so the problem is the incentives alignment. So maybe we ought to rethink our conversation a little bit. How do we get the incentives aligned properly? Uh, and, and part of it is we operate as if the pie is infinitely expandable, so I don't have to do the priority trade-offs. So make members of Congress, uh, allow them to vote only as far as last year's revenue stream, and once they've hit that with yes votes, they can only vote no on everything else and, and, and force that. Uh, give the president a line item veto that actually was drawn to be constitutional rather than unconstitutional. And maybe most substantially, uh, to pick up on Professor Eskridge's comment on, on the efficiency of the judiciary, figure out a way to invite the judiciary back in into enforcing the limits on spending, whether it's discretionary spending or, or so-called undiscretionary. I don't know why we have undiscretionary spending. I, can't we cut that as well? Um, and, then, and then the last thing that might, I think, go to the pie issue is because a lot of this problem is grabbing from constituents that are not yet born. 
And, and maybe we create an office of ombudsman, where if I'm building an interstate highway system and if you bond it beyond the life cycle of it, you can't do that. Or if I'm, if I'm defeating Nazi Germany to make you know, peace for 40 years, uh, I can't pay for that beyond that 40 years. And I certainly can't pay to grab current operations uh, and figure out a way to have an ombudsman have uh, standing uh, guardianship on behalf of future generations to get the incentives lined up. Yeah, I, I, we'll, give it, we'll give an opportunity for the panel to comment on that really uh, very good question. There may or may not be time for one more. Um, th those are all really great, great proposals, and um, I, I, I think that they could help improve matters a lot. I think that's the hardest question, uh, and the panel is stumped to be really candid. I don't believe the panel has an answer of how you get the incentives exactly right. The only thing that occurs to me is Steve Calabresi's point that maybe it's a good thing for committees to be weaker vis-a-vis -vis the executive. If you think that the chief executive, whether it's the governor at the state level or the president at the national level, uh, has systematically better incentives because he has a national constituency and is term limited, maybe for various reasons, um, then uh, anything that would weaken Congress vis-a-vis -vis the president uh, would maybe be a good thing. However, I'm pessimistic about that, so that's for your consideration. I'm pessimistic, you look at the last two presidents, uh, President uh, Bush and Cheney and President Obama, <laughs> and the presidents were the direct engines for a lot of the increase in the size of government in both of those administrations. It's not you know, one or the other. So the president often does have strong incentives to grow the government as well, sometimes even more than, more than Congress. If I can just add one comment. Um, I, I think the balanced budget amendment idea is particularly critical as in terms of having an ombudsman who can look out for the interests of future generations because the structural problem in Congress is members of Congress spending other people's money. Members from Alaska spending federal tax dollars in Alaska. Members from Virginia doing the same thing in West Virginia. Uh, members today spending the money of children who haven't yet been born in future generations. And somehow we have to return to a situation where people are spending resources that they themselves are contributing to instead of spending other people's money. Also, to plug the panel this afternoon, we're going to return to your issue, sir, on the sunsetting panel. Yeah, I was going to just add one thing quickly. I mean, one of the, the focus of trying to develop structures that limit interest groups. I just want to say I'm a little bit skeptical of such structures. And when you think of reform proposals that have come to kind of limit government, uh, or if you take politicians who've been very active, uh, classically somebody like Taft in the 1950s, uh, early 1950s, late 1940s, of trying to roll back the New Deal because he wants to limit government and trying to find uh, uh, other legislators who will come on board, a lot of times they're doing it because they have interest groups that also support that. And interest groups provide the necessary capital, the momentum. When things get really tough, these kinds of interest groups who benefit from reform actually can become the source, uh, and sometimes you're geographically driven or partisan interest groups. So all I'm just trying to say is that I'm not sure that the mechanism will ever be let's create a world in which we limit interest groups and you get pure-minded politicians who think about the broader public interest. It's just to make sure that the, if you want to call it, the environment is as fluid as and competitive as possible so those interest groups that may benefit from reform also have a say and that the system doesn't limit their power. And I think having that probably in mind would be a better way to get the, the, the or if, if this vision is ever going to be accomplished or if you're ever going to find solutions, it's probably going to be when you have strong interest groups who are behind it as well. We'll take yeah, one. can I just make oh, one? Go ahead. I'm very sympathetic to that last point. I would just change, and maybe even go a little further. I think the whole notion of getting incentives right, it sounds good from a sort of law and economics or public choice uh, point of view, but it's wrong. I mean, Madison's whole point is incentives will never be right. Um, they, they make, you can make them a little better or a little less distortive, but the whole point of the Madisonian system is you're going to have confl conflicting incentives which will be partial, 
they will not reflect quite the general good, and then they will check each other, and this question is how to check, the, how, they, how to set up a broader system, a macro system in which they check each other in a way that's conducive ultimately, or at least consistent with a broader vision of the public good, which I think does get to balance budget amendment type considerations and limitations on spending a grandchildren's money type considerations, much more than this effort to micromanage in a clever sort of, you know, cast Sunstein, you know, semi-law and economics way. Everyone's incentives, so they get nudged in the right direction and they do the right thing. I think that's actually somewhat contrary to the Madisonian notion. And I would say rent seeking is a problem. The best way to deal with rent seeking isn't to stop people, try to stop people from seeking rent, which is impossible. It's to limit the amount that can be rented. And that is the core insight behind limited government. And I think it's the core Madisonian and the core American insight, by contrast with European systems, that this is what politicians are going to do. And the key isn't to, I mean, you can make them less, you can have systems within Congress that make rent seeking a little less effective. But the key, again, is to have the, those things that are up for rent be much less ample and less up for grabs than they are now. I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to call this panel to an end, and we thank you so much. Thanks very much.